All right, well, today's the Sunday before Christmas, and just so happens in our Revelation study, we're at the, the place where it talks about Jesus' life. So if you would turn to Revelation chapter 12, we covered the first four verses last week. And verse 5 really is just a summary of Jesus' entire life. He's born, he's he, of course, dies and is risen from the dead and sends to the Father. And then um, you've got him in this verse ruling the nations, which happens in the millennial kingdom. So you've really got everything all summed up in one verse there. Uh, but we'll start in verse 1, chapter 12, verse 1, so we remember where we were last week. And then plan to cover verses 5 and 6 this week, verse 5 being about Jesus Christ, and then verse 6 being about Israel. Uh, so chapter 12, verse 1 says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon upon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Last week we saw that's the nation of Israel. Verse 2, She being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. That's a reference to Israel giving birth to Jesus Christ. Verse 3, There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. That's a reference to Satan. Verse 4, His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So that's a reference to, we saw Satan in verse 3 and verse 4. He, is, he rebels against God and he convinces a third of the angels, that's the third part of the stars of heaven, he convinces a third of the angels to rebel with him. Uh, did cast them to the earth, meaning they're, in view of eternity, they're not going to be in heavenly places. And that's what he's doing today, God's doing today with the church, the body of Christ. Our, we're going to be seated with Christ in heavenly places and we're going to take those positions that are um, that the Satan and his angels used to have that God has cast them out of due to their rebellion against God. So they're cast to the earth and then it says the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So the dragon Satan recognizes this is a reference to going all the way back to Genesis 3.15. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve are tempted by the serpent. They partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's when they sin, the fall of man there, the curse of sin. And with that, with the curse, God promises redemption. He says through the seed of the woman, he is going to bring a redeemer uh, to redeem us from the curse. And, and so when it says, I mean, the woman is Israel, but it's really going all the way back to that promise. Satan recognizing that God promised a redeemer and God would reconcile the the earthly realm back to himself through the seed of the woman. Satan knows that if he can get rid of the seed, if he can get rid of the child here, then God will not fulfill his promise and the earthly realm will remain in control of Satan. And so he stood ready to devour the child as soon as it was born. And we last week looked in Matthew chapter 2, how when Jesus was born in the days of Herod the king, the wise men came and then uh, told him about the birth. And so then Herod had decreed that all male Jews, two years and under, would be killed. And that was a reference to because it took about two years for the wise men to travel to where he was born there in Bethlehem. And so, <clears throat> and so there, that right there is by Herod making that decree to kill the children, that was Satan trying to attack. And he figures if I can kill the seed of the woman, then I can remain in control of the earthly realms and God won't fulfill his promise to reconcile the earth back to himself. And, and so then, but of course, you know, God protected the child. They, in a, um, God told Joseph and Mary to bring him into Egypt, bring him away from Bethlehem because, of the, because Herod was going to be killing those men, those Jewish males that were born two years and under. And so they survived and of course he grew up. And that's a reference in verse 5 there when it says, She brought forth a man-child. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he, he was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Uh, so we're going to look at that today. And then we're also going to look at the woman in verse 6. Um, so the first point we want to look at is really how 
you know, he, in other words, the man child's born, but how does he come about to rule all nations? Satan and the third of the angelic realm have rebelled against God, and they've gotten control of the realms here on earth through the rebellion of us, through the rebellion of man, through the curse of sin here that we're on us. Well, how does the man child come about to rule all nations with a rod of iron? And of course, he comes, Lord Jesus Christ comes, and the first thing he has to do is redeem man from the curse. If we look over in Deuteronomy chapter 27, Deuteronomy 27, really we've give, been given here the Mosaic Law is given to Israel at the time of Deuteronomy 27. They're just about to enter into the Promised Land. And Moses, they've had the generation that had been in the wilderness, uh, they all died off except Joshua and Caleb and Moses at the time. And the reason is because of their unbelief. Joshua and Caleb believed in the promise of God bringing them into the Promised Land and so they lived to go into the Promised Land. All the other ones died in the wilderness, and so at the end of those four, we're at the end of those forty years of the wilderness right now, and so since all those people have died, they've got their children there. And Deuteronomy, the name really is a reference to the second giving of the law. The law was given back in the book of Exodus, but because that generation died off, and now you've got a new generation come up uh, before they enter to the promised land, Moses gives them the law again, so that this new generation will know the law covenant that God has made with them. And in Deuteronomy 27 and in 28, basically you see the cursings and the blessings set forth. You can see in Deuteronomy 27, verses 15 through 26, every verse starts with the word cursed. And it's basically saying you've entered into this law covenant or this law contract with God, and if you do not obey this law covenant, then you are cursed. But then in chapter 28, uh, you see in verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, those are start with the word blessed. And that's saying if they obey the law, they would be blessed. So you've got the, the contrast here. God's made the covenant, the contract with them. If they, if they obey the law, they're blessed. If they don't, they're cursed. And so you've got all these curses here in chapter 27, uh, verses 15 through 26. And look there in verse 26, which is really a summary of the whole matter. Deuteronomy 27, 26 says, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. Uh, so your first point on the outline is that the law cursed all those who did not do the law. The law cursed all those who did not do the law. If they did the law, they would be blessed, according to chapter 28 there. But if they did not do the law, they uh, would be cursed. And Israel, you know, they fell into sin. Romans says, all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. So whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, uh, you're, you've sinned. You don't have, you're not worthy of God's glory. And so all of Israel here is cursed under that law. They failed to obey the law. So they cannot, by the law's standards, cannot enter into the promised land. They cannot have eternal life in God's kingdom because they have fallen short of God's mark. They failed to uphold their part of the contract, the law of covenant. So what God had to do, since there was this contract, contractual obligation that Israel had to fulfill the law in order to enter into the promised land, what God had to do is He had to send Jesus Christ and He had to fulfill the law for them. He fulfilled it in all points, and we'll see that in the second hour. We'll go into that more detail, but he fulfilled the, fulfilled the law, and so then he was not cursed under the law because he fulfilled it perfectly. He then would be what chapter 28 says. You know, he would be blessed. Verse 2 says, All these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. That's what Jesus Christ did. He obeyed the law perfectly, so then all these blessings come upon him. But he didn't come just to get these blessings. He came to redeem Israel. So what he did is when he died on the cross, he became a curse for Israel. Israel, according to chapter 27, is cursed. Jesus, because he fulfilled the law perfectly, according to chapter 28, he's blessed. So what, what Jesus Christ does is he takes the curse for Israel. 
so that then God can see them as obeying the law perfectly by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ so that they can be blessed instead of being cursed and then enter into the kingdom. Uh, if you go over to Deuteronomy 21, this is the provision under the law that allows Jesus Christ. What's that? I forgot about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that allows Jesus Christ to become the curse under the law for Israel. Uh, Deuteronomy 21 and verse 22. Deuteronomy 21, verse 22. It says, If a man have committed a sin worthy of death. Now, we know that Israel is cursed under the law because they've sinned. Romans says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And says, The wages of sin is death. So all of Israel, because they have sinned under that law of covenant, are worthy of death. So this would apply to them. If a man have committed a sin worthy of death. So that's Israel. They're in that situation. They are worthy of death. But then it says, And he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree. His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So according to this verse here, verse 23, the way that someone becomes a curse under the law, a curse of God, it says, is for them to be hung upon a tree. So your next fill in the blank there is Jesus Christ became Israel's curse under the law. So this is all, Jesus Christ, when he came to Israel, he did it all according to the law. The law said, you're cursed if you don't obey the law. It says you're blessed if you fulfill the law. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. Israel didn't. But then Jesus Christ hung on a tree and became a curse for Israel. He became that curse under the law, fulfilling the law of covenant. So that now Israel is no longer, they no longer have to be put to death spiritually by God. They can enjoy eternal life uh, because of Christ's death there on the cross. Uh, you notice that Deuteronomy 21.23 says, His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God. And that's what happened with Jesus. If you go over to the book of John, go over to the book of John, um, probably around chapter 20, maybe 19. I'll find it here. Uh, chapter 19 and verse 31. John chapter 19 and verse 31. It's, it's significant that John tells us this detail because by fulfilling this, it, it fulfills the law requirement that the body not hang on that tree for all night in order to refrain from being a curse from God. Now, they did it for a different reason. They, didn't, they were not trying to fulfill Deuteronomy 21, uh, but nevertheless, it was fulfilled. You see here in John chapter 19, verse 31, uh, this is Jesus has already, in verse 30, he says, It is finished. He bowed his head, gave up the ghost. So he's on the cross. He's been crucified. Uh, he is actually dies there in verse 30. And then verse 31, John 19, verse 31, The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. They broke their legs. They try to speed up the death so that they could, they would be dead and then go ahead and take them off. And you see there in verse 32, Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. And, and so they end up taking him off the cross. Verse 36 says that was a fulfillment of Scripture, that a bone of him shall not be broken. But the point is that Jesus Christ was hung on a tree he was, did not stay there all night. He came down that night. And so he fulfilled the provision of a curse under the law there in Deuteronomy 21. Now Satan did not know about Satan wasn't looking to that verse. He was looking somewhere else. Uh, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, remember our, our starting verse in Revelation 12 that Satan or the dragon was ready to devour the child. He was wanting to kill him. That was his idea. And so his, he wasn't able to kill him initially because through Herod, 
He did decree that all the Jewish males would be killed, but they were able to get away. Jesus wasn't killed. When Satan has him crucified on the cross, Satan believes that he has gotten rid of the seed of the woman. He is now Lord of the earth, and God will never restore the earth back to himself because the seed of the woman has been killed on a cross. That's what Satan thinks. Uh, we see that here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He thinks, he didn't think he fulfilled the curse under the law according to Deuteronomy 21. He thinks he's killed the seed of the woman and God's plan is not fulfilled. We see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. The princes of this world being a reference to Satan's angels, the devils or demons, whatever you want to call them. Verse 7, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So we've seen already, according to Deuteronomy, how Jesus Christ fulfilled the provision of the law, being made a curse for Israel so that, he, so that they may have life in him. But the princes of this world, or the devils that are under Satan, did not understand that. They thought, in other words, Satan is standing there as the dragon, ready to devour the child. And he sees this when he is 30, approximately 33 years old. He sees an opportunity to use the Jews, the high priests, the Pharisees, to get them all together to have Jesus crucified on a cross. And that way the seed of the woman is killed according, as far as Satan is concerned, he has devoured the man-child. Um, but, of course, they didn't understand what God was really doing, that the cross was God's plan all along, because according to this verse, if they knew that, they would not have crucified him. They would have realized they weren't really destroying the seed of the woman. They were really bringing about God's plan of reconciling the earth back to himself. Satan thought God's plan was something different. Let's go over to Psalm 118. Instead of looking at Deuteronomy and seeing the curse to be hang on a tree and him fulfilling that curse, Satan was looking at this verse here in Psalm 118. And he was trying to stop this from being fulfilled, which he did, uh, but that wasn't God's plan. It, it was there as part of God's plan, but God knew that Israel would not fulfill it. They would not have the faith to do this, and without the faith, then God knew that the cross would be the way that God would bring about his plan. Uh, Psalm 118, and let's look at verse 24. Actually, let's look, well... We could go all the way, but we'll start in verse 24. Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. It's referring to a specific day here. It says, Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. So this is a reference to the day when Jesus comes into Jerusalem. You know, the triumphal entry that a lot of times they'll call that, where they set down palm branches, they say, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Uh, they did that part there, blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Then what they were supposed to do is then take Jesus as he comes in, bring him as the sacrificial lamb, the ultimate Passover lamb. John the Baptist said, uh, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. They were supposed to recognize him as the sacrificial lamb, bring him into the altar, put him on the altar, and sacrifice him there, recognizing that he is the, the sacrifice, the lamb, to take away their sins. That's what the next verse says. It says, verse 27, God is the Lord, which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Verse 24, when it says, This is the day which the Lord hath made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. It's a day when Israel, if they had the faith, would by faith take Jesus, recognizing him as the sacrifice for their sins, put him on that altar in the temple, 
and they would bind him with cords and they would sacrifice him as the Passover lamb to redeem them from their sins. That was what the, and that's why it says we will rejoice and be glad in it is finally our redemption has come, our redeemer. And so Satan was looking to this and because Israel did not have the faith to accomplish this, Satan then diverts their attention and gets them to, instead of fulfilling this, he says, let's kill him. Not in faith on an altar, but in unbelief on a cross. And then we will have done, he says, I would have done away with the seed of the woman and God will not reconcile the earth back to himself. That's what Satan was thinking. Uh, so your next fill in the blank there is that Satan thought Jesus had to be sacrificed on the altar in the temple in order for him to die for Israel had to be sacrificed on the altar in the temple. And that is true if they did that. If Israel had the faith and offered him as the sacrificial lamb, they would have done so in faith. His, his sacrifice would have redeemed Israel from their sins, and they would have been ready by faith to just enter into that kingdom. Of course, they still had the seven years of tribulation, but then they would have gone, gone ahead and entered into the kingdom. Yes? Either way, then, Jesus was a sacrifice. Either, either way, his birth was to be sacrificed. Yeah, the plan, the revealed plan of God was for him to, to be born and to fulfill the law for them and to be sacrificed on the altar and to die for Israel's sins. Because yeah, Isaiah 53 mentions that he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquity. So Satan knew all along that God's plan was for him to die as a sacrifice. The difference is that he thought it had to be according to what it says here. If he knew the real plan all along was on the cross, according to 1 Corinthians 2, he would not have had him crucified. And what's great about the plan on the cross, what Satan didn't know is he didn't know the mystery. See, if Israel does this here, Israel is saved in everything, but God only reconciles the earth back to himself. That works according to all the Old Testament, what has been revealed. This here, the mystery, wasn't revealed yet. And so it would be his sacrifice would atone under that law of covenant. But what the cross does, you've had the Jews, the blood, they said Israel, when they had him crucified, they said his blood be upon us and our children. So it's upon the Jews. But then it's Gentiles, it's the Romans who actually crucify him on a cross. So when he is crucified on a cross, not only does it atone for the sins of Israel and their program, it also atones for the sins of the Gentiles today under this mystery program. So if Satan had allowed this to happen, and of course they knew, Satan, you know, God knew that Israel was in unbelief and they wouldn't do this. But if they did this according to the law, all you've got is the earthly program. This here, heavens, the provision on the altar does not provide for the heavenly places to be reconciled back to God. That had to be done on a cross, both the, under the Israel's program and by Gentiles, by Romans. And so since the Gentile Romans crucified him and the Jews under Israel's program, his blood is upon them, then his blood atones for all programs, both Israel's program and the prophecy program. So Satan thinks, I'm getting rid of the, sac I'm getting rid of the seed of the woman because he's not being sacrificed on the altar. But what he did was he 